Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 91 verses 1 and 2 says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let's pray together. Fathers, we gather here today um, in our own homes, I guess, today, Lord. I pray that, that we would be encouraged, that we would remember that you are sovereign, that you are kind, that you are loving. Lord, that you are uh, our shelter, that we do abide, that we dwell in the shadow of you, our almighty and so, Lord, I pray that our hearts would cry today, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Lord, I pray as we worship as families today, that all that we do would glorify your name. I pray that we would be encouraged. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, just a few verses, really 8 through 17. This is, I want to acknowledge, this is odd. We don't normally do this. Even the setup here today is a little bit different. Uh, but we are called to worship God. We are compelled by the great salvation that He has given to us to worship Him. And so we do that however we can. And so we come together separately today to worship our great God and Savior. John Calvin began his ministry in Geneva, Switzerland as um, what we probably would call today as a, as a college professor, but he soon became a pastor. It didn't take long until he was fairly prominent in the city of Geneva, and he began the work of bringing the life and practice of the church into conformity with the teaching of Scripture. The Reformation by this time was now in full swing, after all. Among the reforms he implemented was the exercise of, of church discipline at the communion table. This didn't sit well with some of the prominent citizens of the city of Geneva, many of whom were living in a kind of gross, unrepentant sin. This conflict actually reached a boiling point on Easter Sunday. April 23rd, the year 1538, when Calvin refused to administer communion to certain leading people in the city who were living in open sin. The tension grew so great that he was forced to leave the city. So he made his way to Strasbourg in Germany, where he wanted to be anyway. That's where he had desired to go and teach. But after three years, the city leaders of Geneva wrote to him and asked for him to return and be their pastor again, because while he was gone, the religious and the political situation in their city had pretty much fallen apart. At first, he had no intention of returning. In a letter to a colleague, he wrote that he would rather submit to death a hundred times than to that cross on which one had to perish daily a thousand times over. That's what he thought of the ministry in Geneva. But eventually he changed his mind, and even in the face of the many dangers that he faced there in Geneva, Calvin saw his life in Christ entirely and willingly given to God. His personal motto was, My heart I give to thee, Lord, eagerly and earnestly. And so he submitted to what he believed to be God's will, and he returned to the pastorate in Switzerland. He arrived in Geneva on September 13th in 1541 after being away for three and a half years. His first sermon after he returned, he resumed preaching the scripture at the next verse after the last one that he had covered three and a half years earlier when he was exiled. John Calvin intended for this to be a, a bold statement that he would, he would be all about the verse-by-verse verse preaching of the Word of God, that that would hold a primary place in his ministry. Our plan here at Logansville Church, Lord willing, is that in two weeks we will pick up where we left off in John chapter 15, whether we are able to meet together 
but we're doing it like this. Last week when we canceled, Pastor Ben had been planning to preach from the first four verses of uh, the epistle of Jude. And Lord willing, he will do that next week. But because of our cir current circumstances, uh, this morning I thought, it, I thought it best to look at a passage from the beginning of the book of Romans that gives us a glimpse of the, frankly, of the relationship of the preacher and the church. And I, I think we can find some good application in here for all of us. So Romans chapter 1, let me read verses 8 through 17. Again, at the end of verse 7, he greets them with that apostolic greeting that we greet one another with every week here. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 8 he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray together again. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that um, the distance and the awkwardness of being on video would decrease and that Christ would increase. Lord, we pray that you would increase in our hearts today, that our love and affection for you and for one another would only grow as we read and study your word together. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So as we jump in here this morning, today, there are four characteristics, or really kind of, I guess we're going to talk about three characteristics of Paul's relationship with the Roman Christians that we need to see this morning, that we can be encouraged by. First is Paul's thankfulness. It's his thankfulness. This is really all of verse 8. He says again, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. I want to mention right here that there is no second. Paul just says first, and then he just carries on with the letter. The simple reason, however, for Paul's thankfulness is that this is being proclaimed everywhere he goes. That there are Christians in Rome. He's thankful for what God has done among the Romans. When you think of the city of Rome today, you probably think of the Vatican. We think of the Colosseum. We think of the Vatican. We think of the Pope, the center of Roman Catholicism. But that was certainly not the case in Paul's day. And so when he writes this, Rome was filled with people who worshipped many gods, but especially by this time, the worship of the kind of the cult, the imperial cult, the, uh, the rise of the cult of the worship of the Roman emperor was especially prevalent in the city. Christianity in its early days was seen as just a small sect of Judaism. Most people viewed it like we might view cults today. Strange. They always talk about weird things like coming back from the dead. And they follow someone who claims to have power to heal people and, and yet seems to have disappeared. And so when word spreads that there are Christians in Rome, it had to have been a great encouragement to those who are scattered. It had to have been a great encouragement to the Christians, these small bands of kind of ragtag Christians spread out all over the empire who had really run for their lives because of persecution in Jerusalem. To know, for them to know that a church has been established in really what is the, the capital of the world, this drove Paul to thankfulness because he's hearing about them everywhere, he says. 
We believe that Paul probably wrote this letter near the end of his third missionary journey. He's traveled all around, uh, really all around the eastern part of the Mediterranean through Turkey and uh, Greece, obviously. And his driving mission, a mission that was given to him by Christ himself, was to see Christ proclaimed where he had not been previously known, where people didn't know about Jesus. Jesus himself had said to Paul in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, he actually said this about Paul. He said, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Jesus said that right after he saved him. And Paul himself will say it at the end of this book, at the end of Romans, he says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. And so Paul is filled with thanksgiving. He's thankful that Christ's promises were coming to pass. He rejoiced that when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. He, he, saw, he, he even saw fit to build it as far away as Rome to the ends of the earth. Paul knew that to build a church in Rome, because all roads led to Rome, would lead the gospel genuinely to the ends of the earth. And so he rejoiced. Look again at this verse at Romans 1.8. Why is Paul thankful? It's not because their faith is somehow more exceptional than, than those of the church in Corinth or the church at, at Ephesus or the church at Philippi. He isn't pointing out that they're exceptionally pious or, or they're exceptionally holy. He, he simply gives thanks that there are Christians in Rome, that the news of them has spread throughout the entire world. So let me just stop right there. We're not Rome, but nevertheless, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Everywhere I go, I hear of your faith and of your faithfulness, and I thank my God for Logansville Church. But let's keep moving here, because... Paul doesn't just say, thank God, in a, in a kind of a, a generic or, or a flippant way. He specifically says, I thank my God. And he only uses this expression, I thank my God, or my God, a, a few times in his writings. He uses it in 2 Corinthians near the end. He uses it twice in Philippians and once in Philemon, and each time he uses it, he uses it in such a way that you can get a real sense of his emotions. And so when he writes to the Philippian church, um, have you ever noticed that, that Paul doesn't really have to, he doesn't really have to correct the Philippians for anything. Philippians really is a letter of thanksgiving and encouragement. Keep that in mind as we read these two verses. In his introduction to, the, to Philippians, in chapter 1, verse 3, he says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. And then as he finishes the letter, at the end of the book, he encourages them by saying, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Whenever Paul says, my God, or I thank my God, it's with people he has a particular affection for. And he does so in order to express the, really the personal relationship that he has with God. He's not just a God that is somewhere out there. He's my God. But also when Paul says here, I thank my God, he, he's emphasizing the, the intimate relationship that, that not only he has with God, but that these Roman Christians have as well. They live in a, in a pluralistic society where everybody has their own God. And so when he says, I thank my God, they should have heard him say, because he's your God too. 
relationship that we have with God, we have together. It's the kind of relationship that we can see in the, in the Psalms, for instance. The Psalms can be very, very personal. Listen to kind of the, the bookend verses of Psalm 91. I read the beginning part earlier, but I want to I, I go back to this. Psalm 91, the first two verses, it begins from the point of view of mankind, of, of man. He says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. But that psalm ends with God's point of view. It ends from, from God looking down and God saying, the psalmist is sort of quoting God here and says, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is a promise for us because when we proclaim with Thomas, my Lord and my God, when we say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith. It's not a perfect faith. It's not an especially pious or holy faith, but it's a God-given faith. And I thank my God for you. Well, secondly, not, not only should we be encouraged by Paul's thankfulness, but also by his prayerfulness. His prayerfulness. Look at verses 9 and 10. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul is a man who practices what he preaches. Listen to how he instructed the Thessalonians as he, as he finished up his first letter to him, to them, to the church at Thessalonica. This will sound familiar. He said this, this is the end of his letter. He says, and we urge you brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul never stops praying for the Roman Christians. He prays without ceasing, just like he admonishes others to do. This week, if you're on our email list, this week you received a prayer guide from me. I hope you did. It's a specific guide for this church, for Logansville Church. And when we come back together, we should continue to use that guide as a way to pray for one another without ceasing. When we gather together again, Lord knows when. When we gather together again, we're not going to cease to pray. We should be praying for one another without ceasing. If anything, that list should get more detailed as we get to know one another, as we know specific requests, as we're able to follow up and encourage each other. This is our second Sunday of not being able to meet. We didn't meet last week either. And in my years at Logansville Church, I've not ever missed more than two Sundays in a row. In fact, I think that's true. I actually think that's true of all the elders um, since they've been a part of this church. They've not missed more than two in a row, I don't think. I'm sure that's true for many others as well. So it's going to be vital that you continue, that we continue to pray for one another without ceasing. It's vital that you remember the faith of this church and thank God for His work. That every time you remember one another, that we are thankful for the faith that God has begun in us and continues. It's so important that we pray that, that somehow, by God's will, we may at last succeed in coming together. This is Paul's great prayer here. Somehow, do you see that word? For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, 
I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Somehow. As we see the world crashing around us, um, that word has new meaning, doesn't it? Somehow. If you told us a week ago what we would be looking at on the news this week, we would not have believed you. We wouldn't believe it. But now we can look at this word somehow and say, somehow. Paul saw no way for this to happen if it were left up to him. He saw no way for him to be able to get back there if it was up to him. All he could do was trust God and pray without ceasing. God, I pray that you would bring us together again soon, somehow. But not only did Paul practice what he preached, he, he also practiced what Jesus preached. Because he prayed, not only did he pray without ceasing, he also prayed persistently. Do you remember the parable that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 18? Verse 1, Luke 18, 1 begins like this. It says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. And here's the parable. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For, while he, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that he will not beat me down. She will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Why did Jesus teach them that? So that they would always pray and not lose heart. Luke tells us that right at the beginning. Paul says that God is his witness, he says. He prayed regularly. He prayed often. He prayed without ceasing. He boldly approached the throne of grace, praying that he would somehow be able to finally get to Rome so that he could strengthen them, verse 11 tells us. Verses 13 and 15 say that, that he, might, he might reap some gospel harvest, a, a harvest of righteousness. Many would believe and repent, and repent and believe in Christ for salvation. That more Gentiles would be brought in and, and made to be part of God's covenant people. Somehow. Somehow. Later, God will answer this prayer. As I said, we believe that Romans was written really about the time of the events in Acts chapter 20, probably. Somewhere in there. And as Acts unfolds, Paul returns from Corinth to Jerusalem, where he first goes and visits with Pastor James. But in about a week, he's arrested in the temple. And in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, he actually has an encounter with Jesus, who said to him this, Jesus says to Paul, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And as the story unfolds from there, and I'll let you read that, Paul asks the courts to send him to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen. And by the very end of Acts, the last chapter, Acts 28, verses 14, 15, and 16 say this, Luke in narrating this, says, And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself and the soldier who guarded him. There were brothers there that met him. Brothers that Paul somehow wanted to see. Somehow. God answered Paul's prayer. Somehow. Paul was arrested more than once. He was 
right in smack dab in the middle of riots. He was imprisoned. These events, this is just from, uh, from the time of Acts 20 to the end of the book, Acts 20, 80, he was shipwrecked and, he's, and a viper came out of a pile of wood and bit him. He just wanted to somehow get to Rome to meet the Christians there. And God actually brought him to Caesar to testify. But, and this is really where I'm going to end this morning, not only can we see God's thankfulness or Paul's thankfulness and his prayerfulness, but he's also looking for mutual encouragement. Mutual encouragement. Look, look at 11 through 13. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. He longed to see them. Paul prayed for them. This was the desire of his heart. He missed them. He wanted to be with them. He has heard of their faith and he is encouraged. And he wanted to go and encourage them and to be encouraged face to face. He didn't want to just stop by and preach to them and go home. Yes, he wanted to preach to them. But Paul was not just some hired gun conference speaker brought in to drop an exegetical bomb and then be evacuated. He wanted to impart to them some spiritual gift to strengthen them. He wanted to preach the gospel to them in order to strengthen their faith because their faith, this faith that is proclaimed in all the world, this is how the righteous will live, he says in 16 and 17. They will live by faith. But he also knew that he needed to be encouraged and strengthened by them. And he longed to encourage and strengthen them face to face as well. By them, it was mutual, he says. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And that right there, verse 12. This needs to be building in us, however long we are apart. That longing to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Not just the preacher with the church, but all of us. With all of us. That we would be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. This is where we find ourselves today. YouTube is not church. Live streaming or podcasting is not church. What we are doing today is no substitute for the assembly of the saints. Yet these are not normal times. And Christ has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. That's true now too. And let me just say, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Until then... Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the will of God. So be encouraged. Long to see each other again. Pray without ceasing. And be thankful. Let's pray. Father, it is my prayer today for Logansville Church that we would long to see one another. That we would long not just to chat, not just to hang out. Yes, we long to do those things, but that we would long to encourage one another in 
in faith, to strengthen one another, to bear one another's burdens, to love one another, to, to spur one another on. We long to sing together, to pray together, to give together, to serve one another. Lord, we long to be together in worship. It is good when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, we are waiting for that day. I thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.